Hi friends, welcome to Cardiology Clinical Methods video modules. In this module, I would like to tell about heart sounds and cardiac murmurs. These two are very important next to your pulse, blood pressure and JVP because these two can give ultimate clue to the diagnosis. Coming to the murmurs, we take ventricular systole and diastole for naming the murmurs, not your atrial systole or atrial diastole. The ventricular systole normally lasts for 0.3 seconds and ventricular diastole lasts for 0.5 seconds. In tachycardia, this 0.5 seconds can get decreased. Okay, but this is almost fixed. And systole has two phases. One is an isovolumetric contraction and another is an ejection phase. Diastole has four phases. One is an isovolumetric relaxation, rapid inflow, diastasis and atrial systole. During these two phases, rapid inflow and diastasis, around 80% of the blood from the left atrium to the left ventricle will enter whereas the atrial systole will contribute to the remaining 20% of the blood to come from the left atrium to the left ventricle. This picture no one can forget from Guyton. We will start from this area. Okay. So here what happens? The atrioventricular valve closes. Atrial ventricular valve closes at the time the volume of the ventricle is almost full it is around 130 ml and that causes your atrioventricular valve close closure causes your first heart sounds first heart sound okay then what happens there is a phase of isovolumetric contraction isovolumetric contraction that means the volume is same in the chamber but the chamber starts contracting the volume in the ventricle remains the same see the same 130 ml is there but this chamber starts contracting so that leads to increase in the pressure inside the ventricle so you see this blue line here the pressure in the ventricle increases and once the ventricle's pressure increase, uh, uh, goes above the aorta blood pressure then the aorta valve will open okay the aortic valve will open okay then what happens the next phase that is your ejection phase Okay, after the ejection phase is almost over, when the iota's blood pressure increases over the ventricle's blood pressure, then that will lead to the closure of the aortic valve. Okay, here if you see, there is closure of aortic valve. Then there is a phase of these two we told in systole, then starts the diastole, the isovolumetic relaxation phase. Okay, before going into the isovolumetic relaxation phase, I would like to highlight another one important thing. During the aortic valve closure, during the semilunar valve closure, the aortic and pulmonary valve closure, there comes the second heart sound. So between the first and second heart sound, the phase is systole, S1 and S2, the phase is systole and then between the S2 and the S1, next to S1, this duration is the diastole. So the S2 is contributed by the closure of aortic and pulmonary valve, which are called as semilunar valves. Then comes the isovolumetric relaxation okay so that is diastole's first phase then comes the rapid inflow phase then the diastasis phase then comes the atrial systole phase okay after the atrial systole gets over what happens once again the same cycle starts the AV valve closes here the AV valve closes here again the same isovolumetric contraction ejection phase okay hope you got an idea and see if you carefully watch the third heart sound comes during the diastole during the rapid filling phase during the rapid filling phase the third heart sound comes okay coming to the first heart sound so s1 is also called as the first heart sound best heard at the apex consists of m1 and d1 what is m1 and d1 the closure of mitral and tricuspid valve constitutes the s1 and split is hardly audible. If at all audible, it can be heard only in the tricuspid area. That is very, very, very rare. S1, we need not comment about any split, okay, unless it is grassly there. And uh, most of our cases, which we examine in our undergraduate examination, will not have an S1 split, okay. So factors contributing the intensity of S1. Very, very, very important question. So first, most important factor is the structural integrity of mitral valve. The mitral valve has a lot of structures. Okay, one is uh, your leaflet, commissures, annulus, then your cardiac tendine and papillary muscles, and even ventricle is also included as a, a structure component of your mitral valve. All these structures are very important for proper closing of the valve. 
proper closing only can produce a proper hard sound okay so the structural integrity is very important then comes the position of av valve at the at the time of ventricular contraction so because if there is a wide open valve at the time of ventricular contraction the wide open valve will close abruptly or uh, rapidly that will produce a loud sound whereas if the valve is about to close during the onset of ventricular contraction then it closes with a soft sound right understood then integrity of isovolumetric systole isovolumetric systole means what isovolume that means the volume in the ventricle remains the same whereas the ventricle starts contracting that is called isovolumetric systole if there is any leakage in the ventricle for example if there is a ventricular septal defect then the blood from the ventricle can leak into the right ventricle right if there is any regurgitation murmurs regurgitation present then that can also lead to your abnormality in the isovolumetric systole then comes the heart rate and pr interval these two are interrelated i will tell you in the subsequent slides then comes the contractility only if the ventricle contracts properly a proper sound closure sound can be produced if the contractility is weak then the closure sound will be soft okay so we'll see one by one how they are related position of the av valve during ventricular contraction so first component i told already if the leaflet is not proper if there is any damage then the sound may not be produced properly okay and uh, the position of the av valve normally is semi closed at the end of diastole it's almost near to closure at the end of diastole and it floats in the blood column at the ventricle is almost filled because at the end of diastole the ventricle will be filled with blood and this valve is about to close will be floating in the blood column okay so imagine this is the ventricle okay and your this is your mitral valve okay and uh, at the time of the end of the diastole what happens is the position of the valve will be like this so about to close about to close okay and what is inside the ventricle the ventricle will be filled with blood okay so almost it floats the leaflet will float in the ventricle blood okay whereas what happens in mitral stenosis in mitral stenosis there is narrowing of the valves which valve mitral valve is narrow that is why it is called as mitral stenosis right so, so this is the ventricle this is your valve okay and this is your valve which is stenosed so what happens only this much of the ventricle is filled with blood okay and this leaflet what happens is because there is high pressure the left atrium has high blood volume and there is high blood pressure this keeps the valve wide open the leaflet will be wide open at the onset of systole okay so what happens this wide open valve will close suddenly that will produce a loud s1 very important point loud s1 okay there is high pressure in the light left atrium and the excursion that is the wandering away of the mitral valve is increased and it takes longer time to close okay as the high pressure of the left ventricle is essential to close so these are the reasons why there is a loud s1 hope you got the point okay normally the valve is semi closed at the time of onset of ventricular contraction so it produces a normal heart sound but in mitral stenosis there is an increased left atrial left ventricular pressure gradient this is called the hallmark of the mitral stenosis left atrial left ventricular pressure gradient is increased there is increased pressure in the left atrium okay and the blood will be like it will not be full the ventricle will not be filled with blood because of the obstruction and this lead to wide excursion of the pliable mitral leaflets this mitral leaflets will go for a wide excursion and close suddenly okay so that produces the loud s1 okay the same mechanism applies in tricuspid stenosis also basically the heart sound is produced because of the the first heart sound is produced because of the closure of your mitral valve and the tricuspid valve if the same mechanism in mitral valve can also apply to the tricuspid valve in tricuspid stenosis there can be loud you know loud t1 component m1 t1 component so t1 component will be loud and that will produce a loud s1 in asd what happens so what is the hemodynamics behind asd i'll draw and show here so normally the intraatrial septum is intact and intraatrial septum is intact but here what happens is there is a gap in the atrial septum so what happens so here there is connection between these two areas the more amount of blood will enter into the right ventricle the normal pressure of right uh, left atrium is 4 to 12 okay whereas the right atrium is 0 to 5 okay so what happens more amount of blood from the left atrium 
will enter into the left or uh, right atrium okay from there the blood will enter into the right ventricle right so more amount of blood will be entering into the right ventricle from the left atrium see from here to here then from here to here okay more amount of blood will be entering so that will lead to wide opening of valves and they will keep the valve open till the onset of ventricular systole that will cause a loud s1 understood then other conditions include hyperkinetic circulatory states that is hyperkinetic circulatory states you can tell pyrotoxicosis beriberi anemia okay pages disease so these are the conditions with hyperkinetic circulatory states once again increased flow through the valve keeps the valve open lead to you know sudden opening of your wide open valves that will lead to your loud s1 okay short pr interval short pr interval means what between the atrial and ventricle contraction there is a smaller gap normally after the atrium contracts there will be some time before the ventricle will start contracting before that only the valve will go into the semi closed position okay the mitral valve go into the semi closed position between the atrial contraction and the ventricle contraction but in patients with short pr interval what happens is there will be smaller duration between the atrial contraction and the ventricle contraction so that will lead to you know uh, the valve will not be in the semi closed position at the onset of ventricular systole so that can lead to loud s1 okay so this is uh, about uh, ar how does it cause the uh, changes in the s1 so normally mitral valve closes at the onset of systole as the lv pressure exceeds the la pressure okay the onset of systole what happens the valve will be in the semi closed position as soon as the systole commences the mitral valve will close but in aortic regurgitation or uh, what happens especially coronary aortic regurgitation what happens is the ventricle will be receiving blood during the diastole okay so this is the aorta and this is your ventricle and okay, this is your mitral valve okay what happens is in aortic regurgitation blood from the aorta will enter into the ventricle during the diastole so the pressure will not be much okay and the lv end diastolic pressure during the diastole the pressure will be increased and that will lead to closure of mitral valve early that will lead to soft s1 understood normally what happens only as the ventricle starts contracting the mitral valve will close it will be the semi closed position at the onset of ventricular systole and it will close as the ventricle starts contracting okay whereas in aortic regurgitation what happens large amount of blood which has entered aorta through the previous systole again comes back to the left ventricle okay so that will make the valve close early mitral valve to close early that will produce a soft s1 okay early closure of valve can produce a soft s1 delayed closure will produce a loud s1 okay and the integrity of isovolumetric systole can be lost in mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation aneurysm okay large ventricular septal defect these are the things where the integrity of isovolumetric systole the ventricle should contract as a closed chamber then only the correct amount of sound will be produced so that these conditions will lead to soft s1 okay so heart rate and pr interval what is the relation short pr interval is equal to atrial contraction is quickly followed by ventricular contraction i discussed this point just to one slide back so what happens short pr intervals cause a widely open mitral valve to close during the systole so that will produce a loud s1 okay short pr interval is equal to loud s1 okay so tachycardia is equal to loud s1 why tachycardia causes loud s1 tachycardia also provides less time between the atrial contraction and the ventricle contraction so that will produce a loud s1 so both are interrelated heart rate and pr interval short pr interval and increasing heart rate so both will cause increase in s1 intensity understood then comes the myocardial contractility so the myocardial contractility can be increased in exercise emotions hypoglycemia thyrotoxicosis whatever stress you feel in the body that can lead to increase in myocardial contractility so sympathetic emetics like coffee tea uh, smoking these are the things which can increase the myocardial contractility thereby increasing the intensity of your s1 whereas when the myocardial contractility is decreased especially in conditions like myocardial infarction myocarditis or cardiomyopathy or any drug induced myocardial depression these are the conditions where you get a soft s1 s1 can be variable in what all conditions the most important condition is atrial fibrillation okay 
atrial fibrillation because the atrium is contacting and so on, right? Okay, the ventricle is contacting intermittently. Okay, sometimes the valve will be wide open at the time of onset of uh, ventricular contraction. Sometimes it will be at the semi-closed position. There is chaotic variation in the conduction. Okay, atrium is contacting is very high rate. And the yes, AV node is allowing some impulses, some imp will not be allowing some impulses. So what happens is there is chaotic, okay, irregular contraction of the ventricle. Okay, so sometimes blood will be flowing from the atrium to the ventricle at the time of uh, ventricular contraction. Sometimes it will be paka closed. So these are the reasons behind the variability of S1 in atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation in order to diagnose there are certain points in the JVB there is absent A-wave. In the palpation there will be irregularly irregular pulse. Okay. With the pulse deficit of more than 10. So these are the characteristic points with the variable S1 which can suggest a atrial fibrillation. Then comes the complete heart block. Complete heart block means there is no link between the atrium and the ventricle. Normally what happens, the atrium should contract, then the ventricle should contract. The P wave should be followed by QRS. Whereas in complete heart block, what happens is the conduction will be affected. So that the atrium will contract at its own rate, intrinsic rate, whereas the ventricle will contract at its own rate. Okay. So that will lead to dyssynchrony and that will lead to variable S1. Okay. And sometimes ectopics. Okay. Ventricular ectopics or atrial ectopics can also cause a variable S1. S1 split. S1 split can happen in right bundle branch block and Epstein's anomaly. As soon as you hear the word Epstein's anomaly, you can, uh, you know, you should remember one sound that is called sail sound. Okay, sail sound because of the tricuspid valve leaflet producing multiple sounds, clicks. This is also called a sail sound. Sail like sounds is heard characteristically in Epstein's anomaly. It was asked as an MCQ as well. What happens to the S1 in mitral stenosis? S1 is loud. Why? So at the end of diastole, the valve remains wide open because there is an increased pressure gradient in between the left atrium and left ventricle okay and the valve will be thickened so these are the causes uh, why there is loud s1 in mitral stenosis just imagine that you are closing a door you know near where you are closing a door which, like a um, um, wide open door and narrowly open door which will produce more noise simple mechanism is the loud s1 in mitral stenosis okay so widely opened pliable mitral leaflet closing will produce more sound whereas uh, at semi close position, a valve at semi close position will produce a normal S1 or a soft S1. Okay, so like a door in your home, the same mechanism applies here also. Okay, so if soft S1 is there, what do you think? You can think of a calcified mitral valve or a severe subvalve of fusion or associated MR or AR. Okay, I told MR or AR will disrupt the isoelectric system. Subvalve of fusion can lead to you know improper closure of valves, so that can lead to a soft S1 and calcification. Okay, you should remember that loud S1 or opening snap to be produced, you need a pliable mitral leaflet. Okay, that is this elastic mitral leaflet. Whereas if it is classified, it will not be produced by if it will not produce a loud S1. Okay. And uh, sometimes what happens is there will be RVH, right ventricular enlargement, right ventricular hypertrophy, which pushes the apex, you know, leftwards. And that in that case also, if you ask it, it will not be able to get a proper loud S1. So what about the S1 and mitral regurgitation? S1 is normal in mild MR, soft or absent in severe MR. So the mechanisms are loss of isomolimetric system. Only when the leaflets, you know, coapt, there is a word called C-O-A-P-T. Only when the leaflets coapt, there will be proper sound. Okay. Here what happens is they will not coapt with each other. They will like, you know, prolapse inside the left atrium. So that will lead to failure of the um, mitral valve to close properly. That will lead to soft S1. Sometimes fibrosis and shortening of leaflets will be there. Sometimes myocardial dysfunction can occur secondary to MR. There is a quote called MR begets MR. Okay, MR begets MR. B G T S. What happens? When the valve starts leaking, more amount of blood from the ventricle will get into the left atrium. So what happens? Finally, the chamber starts to enlarge. Okay, as they enlarge more, there will be um, more and more mitral regurgitation and more and more ventricular dilatation and this is a cycling cycle process which increases 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 as the ventricle dilates 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 further and remember a vent gross ventricle dilatation is an indication for a mitral valve replacement in a patient with mitral regurgitation okay coming to the next important heart sound s2 s2 is also called as key to auscultation of the heart it is high pitched even s1 is high pitched a2 p2 it has two components very 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 important for exam purpose a2P2. 
and normally A2 is always louder than P2 because the pressure gradient in aorta I think compared to the pulmonary artery is more right aorta is the systolic, systemic hypertension uh, circulation is having 120 80 right blood pressure so that A2 will be louder wherever you ask a rate, A2 will be louder than P2 okay and A2 P2 split you should be able to explain what is the significance what is the reverse split what is the normal split everything okay so normally the split widens during inspiration okay I told the reason in the previous module during inspiration more amount of blood will be entering from the right atrium to the right ventricle from the peripheries the blood will be collected by the inferior vena cava and superior vena cava into the right atrium more amount of blood will be entering into the right ventricle and more amount of enter will be entering through the pulmonary artery so that makes the pulmonary valve to close little late okay a2 p2 right so a2 will close the normal time whereas the p2 because of more amount of blood coming through the right side so this is your right atrium this is your right ventricle this is your pulmonary artery okay this is your pulmonary valve just a minute so during inspiration more amount of blood will enter right so more amount of blood more amount of blood will be entering okay and more amount of enter blood will enter into the right ventricle as well and more amount of enter blood will be entering into the lungs okay so from here so this makes the valve the pulmonary valve to close late that causes the normal split during inspiration okay but if when will you call a split as abnormal split when there is split during expiration it is definitely abnormal or when the split increases with expiration it is definitely abnormal these are the two clinical points which you should understand when there is a split during expiration or when there is a split which is increasing with expiration these are the two things two two pointers for an abnormal split okay so abnormal s2 can be of these uh, five types no split or single s2 wide variable split wide fixed split closed split or reversed or paradoxical split so there are the these are the five variants with which we can discuss about the s2 okay normal split i told already it is the a2 the aortic valve followed by the pulmonary valve this is the normal closure of your uh, closure sequence okay and this closed split is characteristically seen in pulmonary hypertension okay sometimes single s2 can also be heard in pulmonary hypertension remember closed split is classically given in harrison's for pulmonary hypertension okay so single s2 can be heard in either of the aorta or pulmonary arteries yeah if the valve is not developed properly then there is only one closure sound right if pulmonary valve is not developed properly then the aortic valve only will close that will produce a single s2 this one vice versa and pulmonary hypertension there will be closed split extreme loudness of one of the sounds can mask the other sound okay that also can cause a single s2 okay wide split wide split can be due to prolonged rv ejection i told you during inspiration large amount of blood will be there in the right ventricle that will be take, taking longer time so that can cause a you know wide split delayed electrical impulse to rv for example in a patient with bundle branch block okay so bundle branch block means the electrical conduction pathway is impaired so there will be muscle to muscle conduction okay left ventricle will contract properly then the right bundle branch in the patient's right bundle branch block it takes longer time for the impulse to conduct so that the ventricle will find it difficult to contract or it takes longer time for the ventricle to contract so there can be wide split s2 and earlier ejection of lv especially in mr so what happens in mitral regurgitation normally the blood from the left ventricle should go through the aortic valve alone right but in mitral regurgitation what happens is part of the blood will be going into the left atrium through the regurgitation and part of the blood will only will closing through going through the aortic valve so that leads to earlier aortic closure followed by normal p2 pulmonary closure okay so that also can cause a wide split s2 understood when a split widens in inspiration enhanced physiological splitting okay so normally a2 p2 is the sequence and if the split is very wide okay then that is called enhanced physiological splitting that can have a right bundle branch block i told the reason in the previous slide okay left bundle left, left ventricle will contract normally whereas right ventricle can contract only with muscle to muscle conduction because in the bundle branch there is a block okay so that will take longer duration for the ventricle to contract so the ap2 will close late okay in pulmonary stenosis also 
the amount of blood in the right ventricle has to glow, go through a narrow wall. So it takes longer duration for the right ventricle blood to get emptied. So that will also cause a wide A2P2. In pulmonary hypertension, actually uh, the classical teaching is, okay, classical teaching is closed split. You have to neglect this point. Okay, this is uh, just uh, strike out this point. This is wrong. Okay, and ventricular septal defects. What happens? Ventricular septal defect also. That is the blood from the iota to the from the left ventricle will go partly into the right ventricle as well. Okay, so the iota of the IT will close earlier, whereas part of the blood from the left ventricle has gone into the right ventricle. So it takes longer duration for the right ventricle to empty. So that will cause the late P2. Okay, so basically A to P2, the enhanced or widened splits can be due to an early A2 or a delayed P2. So early aortic valve closure or a delayed pulmonary valve closure. Okay, you have to remember that. So wide fixed split. It's the hallmark of ostium secundum ASD. Very, very, very important point. Okay. So inspiratory expiratory variation can only happen if there is an intact intraatrial interventricular system. Okay. Otherwise, what happens during inspiration, there will be increased blood which will be entering into the left atrium. Okay. And during expiration, there will be increased blood in the left atrium which can enter into the right atrium. Okay. So there will be shunting of the blood. So that will, you know, affect the split. Okay. And makes it wide fixed split. That is, usually there is split widens and narrows because of the inspiratory expiratory variation. This inspiratory expiratory variation will be affected in presence of a shunt in the atrium. Okay. So it's a hallmark finding in ostium secundum ASD. If the examiner asks you what else, where else you can get a wide fixed split? This is PAPVC, that is partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. Okay, partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. Okay, yes, reverse split. So, reverse split is completely, totally abnormal. So inaudible split during inspiration and audible during expiration. Okay. That can happen with delayed aortic closure or early pulmonary closure. Okay. And clinically I told already if the split widens in inspiration it is equal to reverse split. Okay. So what are conditions? In aortic stenosis, the left ventricle takes a lot of time to empty the blood. So the aortic valve will close late. So that can lead to P2A2. In HOCM, the same can happen. In left bundle branch block, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy behaves like a aortic stenosis only. In left bundle branch block, what happens is the right ventricle will contact early. So the blood from the right ventricle will enter into the pulmonary circulation and the P2, the pulmonary valve closes. After that, there will be muscle to muscle conduction in the left ventricle. So that takes longer duration. That will lead to delayed a, you know, aortic closure. So P2A2. And ventricle pacing, especially right ventricular pacing. Okay. So, if there is complete heart block, you are inserting a pacing lead. Okay, pacing lead will usually be placed in the right ventricle. Okay, the jugular vein you will go into the right atrium and the right ventricle you will place. Okay, so in that case, uh, the, uh, the left ventricle has to depend on the pacing from the right ventricle. It mimics like a left bundle branch block only. So that can cause a reverse splitting. Okay, so where all you get a loud A2? Systemic hypertension, aortic aneurysm. Aortic regurgitation due to aortic root disease. Okay, so these are the conditions where you get a loud A2. Loud P2 you can get in pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary arterial dilatation, left right and hypercanty circulatory states. Okay, these are the conditions you can get a loud P2. Okay, so when can you comment that there is a loud P2? It is very very important point, practically important. When the P2 is equal to A2 intensity or if the P2 intensity is more than A2. Basically, in what is intensity, what is pitch? Intensity is equal to loudness. So if you increase the volume of your music player, that is called your intensity. Whereas pitch is, uh, you know, the sound high pitch, low pitch. The, that is uh, basically music, the low pitch is, uh, the, this is low pitch, uh, this is high pitch. Okay, so in pitch is frequency of cycles per second. Okay, so that is basically uh, changing the tonal quality. Whereas the amplitude or the loudness, okay, is the intensity. Okay, so if the intensity of P2 is more than or equal to A2, uh, then you can tell this loud P2. Okay, coming to S3. So ventricular gallop or proto-diastolic gallop. The other name of S3 is ventricular gallop or proto-diastolic gallop. The mechanism is sudden limitation in long axis filling. This occurs in the rapid filling phase. This is the most com consistent mechanism, sudden limitation in long axis filling. So how does it happen? Mitral valve opens, rush of blood in the ventricle, halted abruptly because the compliance of the left ventricle chamber is decreased. Okay, so that can be due to infarction. 
okay the can be due to um, abnormal contracting in the left ventricle so these are the places where the compliance that is the distensibility of the ventricle will be getting affected so this blood flow will suddenly come to all that will lead to s3 okay and it corresponds to rapid filling phase a normal s2 s3 gap is 120 to 160 milliseconds okay right when S3 is not possible, if there is a valve stenosis, the rapid filling will not be happen if the valve is stenosis, especially atrial ventricle valve stenosis, like a mitral stenosis or uh, uh, tricuspid stenosis, the rapid ventricle filling will not happen. So in that case, S3 is not at all possible. Okay. Coming to S4, sorry, before coming to S4, we will discuss about the causes of S3. Physiological causes in hyperdynamic circulation states, children, young adults, Pathological causes in ventricular failure, non-failure causes can be hyperkinetic circulatory states, uh, regurgitation, okay, large amount of blood will be there, okay, which will regurgitate, okay, and that will cause an S3, like a mitral regurgitation. Large amount of blood will enter into the atrium, again will be pushed forwards, okay, faster, so that will lead to S3 and uh, artery venous fistula. S3-like sounds are pericardial knock or tumor plop. Pericardial knock can be heard in constrictive pericarditis, tumor plop can be heard in atrial myxoma. Okay, so what is the closer differential for this S3? It is your opening snap. Okay, because opening snap also, uh, opening snap occurs in mitral stenosis. It occurs during the diastole. S3 also, S3 can occur in failure. It also occurs in the diastole. Most, both are similar uh, timing. So, this is very important. Interval is more for S3, whereas less for opening snap. This opening snap will be heard uh, mainly in the mid especially in the like half an inch medial to your uh, apex okay there you can hear it best sometimes it can be heard in the entire precardium whereas this s3 can be heard only in the apex very very important point opening snap is high pitched whereas s3 is low pitched character is snapping character opening snap is a character a snapping character whereas here is a thudding character this loud s1 and mdm will be almost always associated with the opening snap because it is characteristically heard in either mitral stenosis or a tricuspid stenosis whereas here the heart may be normal, soft S1 can be there or a pan-systolic murmur because of a regurgitant lesion, okay, can be there. Variation on standing A to OS, the gap between the aortic closure and the opening snap will increase with standing whereas there is no change between the A2 and S3, okay. Now tell what is the, how will you difference between RV and LV heart sounds? So LV heart sound is LV S3 or LV S4, okay, so both will be heard best in the LV apex, okay. And here this RV will be RV S3 S4 will be heard best in the RV apex that is RV impulse area that is the lower left sternal area. Okay and this will be heard and best in the left lateral decubitus position and this uh, RV S3 and S4 can be heard also in the subsified region. This LV sounds are increased by sustained hand grip whereas RV sounds are increased by inspiration. These are the characteristic differential points for differentiating between your LV versus RV S3 S4 sounds. Okay. This is also good for both S3 and S4. So S4 is also called as atrial gallop or pre-systolic gallop. Okay. And it is a low frequency sound same as S3. Here what happens is there is forcible atrial contraction against non-compliant ventricles. Okay. So non-distensible ventricle, the atrium is contracting. So the, basically this happens during the atrial contraction phase. Okay. S3 happens in the early filling phase. Okay. Whereas S4 happens in the atrial contraction phase. That is the end of the diastole. Okay, heard if the LV end diastolic pressure is more than 15 millimeter on mercury. Okay, uh, just uh, this is a, a point to be remembered, that's all. And this is not very important. Okay, so LV end diastolic pressure if it is more than 15 millimeter on mercury. Okay, if it is very non compliant, then this S4 can be heard. Okay, requisites of S4 there should be a healthy atrium which can generate impulse. So, what I mean to say is in atrial fibrillation, this S4 cannot be generated because of the atrial contraction which contributes to the sound. Okay, and the AV valve should be non-stenosed. So in mitral stenosis, you, can, you cannot expect a S4. As discussed already, S3 also needs a non-stenosed atrioventricular valve. Similarly, in S4 also, you need a non-stenotic atrioventricular valve and non-compliant, non-dilated ventricle is essential. Okay, so ischemia, infarction, concentric hypertrophy, residual cardiomyopathy, with the acute volume overload. These are the conditions you get a non-compliant, non-dilated ventricle. Whereas S3 is usually chronic regurgitation lesion like a mitral regurgitation. So in that conditions you can hear whereas S4 needs a non-compliant, non-dilated ventricle. So pathological causes, LVH with aortic stenosis, hypertension, HOCM, 
RVH causes, right ventricular hypertrophy causes, pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary hypertrophy. These are the causes. And coronary artery disease and acute regurgitation lesion. Acute, okay, acute MR. That can cause this, okay. <clears throat> because in acute MR, the left ventricle will not be grassly dilated. Okay, understood. So, these are the pathological causes of S4. What is summation gallop? S1, S2 merged with S3, S4 is called as summation gallop. So, what is triple gallop? Triple gallop. Gallop rhythm happens usually in hypotonic circulatory states or in failure. Normally, you will hear S1, S2 plus S3 if it is heard, it is called as triple gallop. So, what is quadruple gallop? Quadruple, quadruple is 4 sounds. So, S1, S2 plus S3 and S4 is called as quadruple gallop. If the S1, S2 merges with the S3, S4, it is called as summation gallop. Okay. What are the sounds we hear? Opening snap. So opening snap is a high pitched, best to detect the diaphragm of the stiff at the lower left, uh, you know, sternal angle, uh, this sternal border, or, or sometimes medial to the apex. Okay, snap is less well heard at the apex. Okay, exactly at the apex, sometimes it will not be well heard, but slightly medial. Okay, in this lower left sternal border, you can hear it. It indicates that the valve is mobile. So loud S1 also tells that the valve is mobile, it's not calcific. Similarly, the opening snap also tells that the valve is mobile, non calcific. Okay, right. And what is ejection click? Abrupt dooming motion of valve coming to abrupt halt. Okay, the dooming motion is important and coming to abrupt halt is important. This classically uh, we heard in where? Aortic stenosis and pulmonary stenosis. Okay, so ejection click, which is the opening of the uh, stenotic valve. Okay, and uh, this mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis, that is the atrioventricular valve opening will produce an opening snap. Whereas the semilunar valve's opening will produce an ejection click. Okay. So aortic versus pulmonary ejection click, how to differentiate? This aortic ejection click is widely audible. It is associated usually with left ventricular hypertrophy and it is constant without respiratory variation. These are the characteristic points about the aortic ejection click. Whereas pulmonary ejection click, I told an important point, right? All the right-sided heart sounds will be increasing with inspiration except the pulmonary ejection click, which increases with expiration. Okay. So what is a non-ejection click? You can hear in mitral valve prolapse syndrome or tricuspid valve prolapse syndrome. A few words about that. What is the mechanism of the click? It is because of the sudden tensing of slack elongated cardiac tendine. Sudden tensing of slack elongated cardiac tendine. Okay, basically the mitral valve apparatus, there will be a annulus. Okay, there will be leaflet, anterior mitral leaflet, posterior mitral leaflet. So these ends are called commissures. This end and this end is called as commissures. Okay, then we will be having viscous structures called cardiac tendine. Okay, they will be connecting to the papillary muscle. Okay, papillary muscle will be connecting to the ventricle wall. Okay, so this is the normal your, uh, structure of the mitral valve apparatus. Okay, here is papillary muscle, anterior papillary muscle, posterior papillary muscle. Okay, so this is the normal structure. So if there is a sudden tensing of slack elongated cardiac tendon, that can produce a mid or late systolic click, which is classical of mitral valve prolapse syndrome. It's also called as Barlow syndrome or floppy mitral valve syndrome or below mitral left valve syndrome. Okay, so another mechanism watch the, uh, what they suggest is prolapsing mitral leaflet. When it reaches the maximum exertion, excursion, then it can produce a click. Okay, so there are two mechanisms which are suggested for a mid or late systolic click in mitral valve prolapse syndrome. So one is the sudden tensing of slack elongated cardiac tendine or by the prolapsing mitral leaflet when it is produced, when it reaches the maximum excursion, maximum distension limit. Okay. What other sounds are there? One is a pericardial knock, which is a high-pitched diastolic sound current constrictive pericarditis. It is due to abrupt cessation of diastolic filling. Okay, and pericardial rub, it is a basically a friction rub which happens in pericarditis. Okay, the friction between the parietal and the pericardium, and that is hundred percent specific for acute pericarditis diagnosis. But the sensitivity is less. Okay, and it is a scratchy or leathery sound has three components: ventricular systole, which occurs one during ventricular systole, another is during the rapid uh, early diastolic filling and another is the pre-systolic filling after the atrial contraction. So these are the three uh, area, three uh, no, components of the cardiac cycle which will contribute to the triple quality sound. Okay, it is also called as a triple quality of sound. It's a leathery or scratchy quality. Okay, so it, yeah, it has three components. Okay, remember these three components. Okay. Anything else is left? Anything else? Yes, tumor plop. Tumor plop is held in the it's also a diastolic sound. Here in the left or right little bit so much. If the uh, you know the tumor is mobile with the long pedicle, okay. If the basically it arises from the intraatrial septum, the tumor is mobile with the long pedicle, then it can go above and uh, upwards, okay. So that can cause a tumor plaque. 
Okay, that can also produce a mid-diastolic murmur. Okay, so any other sounds are left? Yes, one another sound is there. That is prosthetic click. Prosthetic click which can be heard in valve replacement conditions. Okay, so a patient with a mitral aortic valve replacement can have a prosthetic heart sound, prosthetic clicking sound. Okay, like a tick tick watch sound can be heard. Okay, so having done this, we have come to the end of your heart sounds. So we have discussed a uh, lot of things, lot of mechanisms. Okay, S1, S2, S3, S4, then your pericardial rub, your uh, clicks, then ejection click, opening snap, S tumor plop. Okay, so those are a lot of the conditions, a lot of conditions we have discussed here. And the mechanism behind S1, we have discussed the split mechanism we have discussed. Split is very, very, very important. Never miss. Uh, no, in auscultation, you should comment whether the P2 is loud or not and whether there is splitting, whether it is normal splitting or abnormal splitting. Okay, you should comment in the exams. Very, very important. So now going to the cardiac murmurs. Murmur. So what does it mean? Basically, if you are holding a tube in your garden, you are watering and suddenly if you are squeezing the tube, okay, what happens? There will be rapid turbulence of flow and can produce a sound also. Similarly, in our body, when there is an increased flow through the normal valve, okay, or a turbulent flow through an abnormal flow, it can produce a murmur. Understood? Increased flow through a normal valve or a turbulent flow through an abnormal valve can produce a sound which is called as murmur. Okay, it is an auscultatory finding. And palpable murmur is called as thrill. Palpable murmur is called as thrill. Okay, so turbulent flow can occur as, uh, occur across an abnormal valve or a septal defect or an outflow obstruction. Outflow obstruction means in the iota somewhere if there is obstruction that can produce a murmur. And if the valve is stenosed, okay, if the valve is regurgitating, then it can produce a murmur. And if there is a septal defect like a VSD, okay, atrial septal defect, the septal defect per se will not cause a large murmur. But in VSD, there is a large amount of pressure gradient between the left ventricle and right ventricle, so that can produce a murmur. Okay. So how to describe a murmur? This is a mnemonic you should remember. P Q R S T. So pitch, position of the patient, and stethoscope. Okay. So whether you oscillate with the bell of the stethoscope or the diaphragm of the stethoscope, that is important. Then comes the quality. Then respiration, respiratory variation and radiation. Radiation especially in case of mitral regurgitation where it gets radiated to the axilla and aortic uh, murmur which can be conducted or radiated to the carotids. Okay, so these are the aortic sinus murmur. So these are the conditions where you will definitely comment about the radiation. Then you have to mention the site, which site, the mitral area, or aortic area, or tricuspid area, that should be mentioned. Then timing, whether it is a systolic or diastolic, then the grading of the murmur. So these are the things which you should describe when you tell about a murmur. Okay, the example is given below. This is a classical murmur heard in mitral stenosis. You should say it fully, okay. Low pitched, rough rumbling, mid-diastolic murmur of grade 3 by 6 heard at the bell of the stethoscope in the left lateral position when the breath is held in the end of expiration. So, this covers the entire story, the entire things about the murmur. Right. Usually, I told uh, in the previous module only, HD, remember, mnemonic, High frequency sounds will always be heard with the diaphragm and low frequency sounds will be low frequency or low pitch. High frequency or high pitch are one and the same. Okay. So low pitch sounds or low frequency sounds will be heard best with the bell of the stethoscope. Okay. So how to time the murmurs? This here is the toughest job. Not very tough actually. You have to palpate the carotid with one of your hands and auscultate the murmur. Okay. So, whichever is coinciding or falls exactly with the carotid will be the systolic murmur. Okay. The carotid pulse coincide with the systolic phase or sometimes the carotid will coincide with the S1. Okay. So, whichever murmur falls exactly on the carotid impact, when you palpate here, you are feeling the carotid impact the same time a murmur is heard, that should be a systolic murmur. Okay. So, this is how you time the murmurs. What is the grading of murmur? So, there is a grading called Levin and Freeman grading. Six grades or grades are there. The first grade we will not give to any any person because um, it is heard only by an expert. So we are not experts. So we will put grade two for a murmur which we hear. Sometimes easily heard, no thrill. When it is grade three, loud murmur with the thrill. Okay, is equal to grade four. Very very important point. If you commit thrill in palpation, you should tell that the murmur is grade four by six. Understood? And grade five is very loud, often heard over a wide area with thrill. And a grade 6 is extremely loud heard without a stethoscope. Okay, so that can also rarely happen. The murmur is extremely loud. You can just uh, off stethoscope. If you keep the stethoscope slightly off the skin, you can also hear the murmur. Okay, so this is the Levin and Freeman grading of murmurs. And how will you name the murmurs? Mid diastolic, early diastolic, mid systolic. So we will see the terminologies, what they mean and what they convey. 
so mid sister like murmur so it begins after the first art sound and ends before the second art sound so we'll usually draw diagrams and demonstrate this s1 l s1 is usually in mitral stenosis s1 is loud so you draw a big line okay you can draw a line like this mitral stenosis what you how will you draw is big s1 okay then you will draw a small line that is s2 okay then you will draw this opening snap okay then you will draw murmur okay then pre-systolic accentuation murmur intensity increases then comes the s1 okay otherwise normally you will draw a small line for s1 and big line for s2 okay so mid systolic murmur what happens is it starts after the s1 and ends before the s2 okay this is the mid systolic murmur okay so hollow systolic murmur means begins with the first heart sound occupies all of the systole and ends with the second heart sound this is classically heard in mitral regurgitation tricuspid regurgitation and ventricular septal defect so all of the systolic murmur will you draw so you draw one line for the s1 s2 some people will draw two lines because a to p2 will be there okay so you want difference between these two what happens is uh, this murmur comes from here from the s1 to the whole of s2 okay so this is called pan systolic murmur or hollow systolic murmur so ejection systolic murmur how will it be begins after the s1 at the completion of isovolumetric contraction phase and ends before s2 and it is crescendo decrescendo in intensity okay so ejection systolic murmur classically begins after the ejection click okay it also similar to this only okay so s1 s1 to s2 is a systolic phase okay and usually what happens is it begins with a click ejection click okay after the isovolumetric relaxation and will be crescendo and decrescendo in nature okay right then because the ventricle contraction will be maximum at the middle okay middle phase of the systole only the ventricle contraction will be maximum that produces a loud sound so that is why this murmur is diamond shaped okay crescendo decrescendo crescendo means the musical term basically gradually increasing in nature is called as crescendo whereas gradually decreasing in nature the intensity gradually decreasing intensity means loudness okay gradually decreasing is called as decrescendo okay and what is late systolic murmur okay begins after s1 okay so s1 is there s2 is there begins after s1 okay but extends to s2 okay this late systolic murmur is heard in mvps mitral valve prolapse syndrome okay you understood what is mid systolic what is hollow systolic ejection systolic and late systolic murmur right next coming to the diastolic murmur and continuous murmur mid diastolic murmur it begins clearly after an interval after a second heart sound okay so this is the first heart sound this is the second heart sound and clearly occurs after an interval the murmur starts okay this is the mid diastolic murmur okay then comes the your s1 okay so clearly occurs after a gap between the s2 and the murmur this is called mid diastolic murmur early diastolic murmur will begin with s2 okay mid diastolic murmur the classical examples are mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis this gap occurs because of the isovolumetric relaxation okay and that, then after that isolimetric relaxation phase only the valve will open and that will lead to the, that leads to this gap. Whereas in AR, aortic regurgitation or pulmonary regurgitation, as soon as the diastole starts, there is murmur. Okay. So S1, S2. So as soon as this uh, S2 comes, there is a murmur. Okay, this is the S1. There will not be any gap between the S2 and this murmur. Okay, that is called as early diastolic murmur. And continuous murmur begins with the systole. Okay, I'll try and show you. So continuous murmur begins with the systole, peak near the S2. So it increases intensity near the S2. So continue in all are part of the diastole. Okay, this is the classical description of a continuous murmur, which can be heard in the classical in patent ductus arteriosus. Okay. So what are the common systolic murmurs which we encounter in our practice? Ejection systolic murmur, late systolic murmur, and pan systolic murmur, which is also called as hollow systolic murmur. So, ejection systolic murmur is heard in aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, and HOCM. Okay. So, when the blood is ejected from the ventricle, either the left or right ventricle, through the aorta or pulmonary valve, which is stenosed, that will produce an ejection systolic murmur. Okay. So, late systolic murmur can be heard in prolapse syndromes, your mitral valve prolapse syndrome or tricuspid valve prolapse syndrome. Pan systolic murmur or hollow systolic murmur can be heard in MR, TR, VSD. That is, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation and ventricular septal defects. Okay. As soon as the ventricle starts contracting, there will be, you know, regurgitation of blood or the blood will be pumped from the left ventricle to the right ventricle in case of VSD. So that will produce a pan systolic murmur. Okay. What, what else can be differential diagnosed for a pan systolic murmur is your prosthetic valve leak. 
prosthetic valve leak. You are fixing a valve, new valve, because uh, the previous valve, the native valve is deceased. For example, the mitral stenosis, grossly stenosed valve, which we, we cannot do a balloon repair, balloon uh, in dilatation, they will go for a valve replacement. If that valve is having a leak, okay, then there will be a pan-systolic murmur. Okay. So what are the diastolic murmurs we know? Early diastolic murmur and mid-diastolic murmur. Early diastolic murmur, when the blood which is pumped through the aorta or pulmonary artery is coming back due to aortic regurgitation or pulmonary regurgitation, that will cause an early diastolic murmur. Okay. So what are the causes of mid-diastolic murmur? Mid-diastolic murmur can be heard in hydro stenosis, tricuspid stenosis. And these are the classical differential diagnosis for a mid-diastolic murmur. We will discuss the mechanism later. Just know the names. Austin Flint, Carrie Coombs, Returns, Flow mid-diastolic murmur. Okay, and right side can be due to ASD, left side can be due to VSD, PDA, MRA. Okay, so these are the characteristic examples of your mid-diastolic murmur. Some can be organic, especially in mitral stenosis or tricuspid stenosis. Some can be due to a mere flow, increase in flow through the areas. Okay, so that, that can be due in ASD or VSD, PDA like that. Okay, so these are the characteristic examples of diastolic murmurs. Okay. So coming to the continuous murmur, what did we learn about continuous murmur? It starts from the systole, peak near the S1, continuing into all, all part of the diastole. Okay, so starts from the S1, peaks near the S2, then continues into all or part of the diastole. So start, this is the diagram, okay. Peaks near the S2, there's the intensity increases and you can stop here, okay, all or part of the diastole. So classically heard in pulmonary, uh, patent ductus arteriosus, anomalous origin of left coronary artery and pulmonary artery, iota pulmonary window and rupture sinus of valsalva. When the iota ruptures into your right atrium that also we can hear a continuous murmur okay so the what are the sites of this continuous murmur the patent ductus arteriosus murmur is called as gibson's murmur it is also called as missionary murmur continuous missionary murmur it's also called as gibson's murmur or gibson's area that is the left first intercostal space before below the left clavicle where you can hear this murmur okay it's written second intercostal space but you can also hear in the first intercostal space just, just below the clavicle okay and third intercostal space, it is the iota pulmonary window murmur. And third and fourth intercostal space, left side is your rupture sinus of Valsalva murmur. Okay. There are two other continuous murmurs, which is one is a cervical venous hum. Especially in children and adolescent population, there is a grossly increased flow that can produce a venous hum. Okay, and mammary shuffle. Mammary shuffle is a, when a lady is pregnant, there will be increased blood flow in the breast. That can produce a murmur-like sound from the blood vessel. Okay, that is also called as mammary shuffle, which will also mimic a continuous murmur. Okay, there are two other variants. One is a to and fro murmur and another is a systolic or diastolic murmur. So to and fro murmur should happen via a single channel. When a patient is having aortic stenosis with aortic regurgitation or a pulmonary stenosis with pulmonary regurgitation, this murmur can happen. Occupies the mid-systole and early diastole, does not peak around S2. Okay, when the murmur starts from the S1 and peaks around S2 and extends into all or part of the diastole, it is called as continuous murmur. Whereas here, this murmur, okay, I'll draw and show you. Starts from the middle of the systole. Okay, does not peak actually. Just uh, same intensity and it ends in the diastole. Okay, this is your to and fro murmur. Okay, S1, S2, S1. Okay, right. So, systolic or diastolic murmur occupies systole and diastole, occurs through different channels and does not peak around S2. So, the classical example is. VSD with aortic regurgitation. So ventricular septal defect will cause a pan systolic murmur, whereas aortic regurgitation will cause a early diastolic murmur. So in the systolic phase there is a murmur, diastolic phase there is a murmur, both will merge also, but there will not be any peaking near the S2. Okay. And it occurs through two channels, one from the aortic valve and another from the septal defect. Okay, so this is called a systolic or diastolic murmur. Okay. So where do you get changing murmurs? Changing murmurs. Like day to day, if you ask a little morning, there will be one murmur. In the evening, there will be another murmur. Okay. It can ha characteristically happen in caricoms murmur, that is in acute rheumatic valvulitis. Rheumatic fever can cause rheumatic valvular edema. The valvular edema, mitral valve edema can be there. And that edema can change in intensity. The how much edema is there can change in the day to day. So that can produce a changing murmur. And in infective endocarditis, changing murmur is a definitive point. Atrial thrombos and atrial myxoma can also cause a changing murmur. Okay, these are called changing murmurs. Another is what is innocent murmur? So innocent murmurs occur in patients without cardiac abnormalities. Okay, have characteristically happens due to increased blood flow. There are two variants. One is a stills murmur, and another is a 50-50 murmur. Okay, so basically uh, this is these are short, soft systolic murmurs heard over the supraclavicular and along the sternal borders. Okay, supraclavicular area and sternal borders. 
In children, it is called a stills mammoth. Adults more than 50 years, 50% 50 of the adults more than 50 years will have this mammoth, this innocent mammoth. So it is called as 50-50 murmur. Okay. So innocent mammoth is basically there is no cardiac abnormality, but there is a murmur because of the flow. Okay, increased flow. And in children, it is called a stills mammoth. In adults, it is called as a 50-50 murmur because 50% of the adults more than 50 years will have this murmur. Okay. So what are functional mammoths? Functional mammoths occur because of the dilatation of heart chambers or vessels or increased flow. Here I have given the examples from the increased flow only. When there is a severe aortic regurgitation, what happens? Large amount of blood will come back to the left ventricle, which is ejected forwards will come back to the left ventricle. Again, when it is pushed forwards, there can be a systolic murmur. Classically, aortic stenosis will produce an ejection systolic murmur, but system ejection systolic murmur can also be heard only in aortic regurgitation because the large amount of blood which is received back during the diastole will be pushed forward during the next systole can cause an ejection systolic murmur. This can also happen in dilatation of aorta. The same principle applies for pulmonary regurgitation also, dilatation of pulmonary artery and pulmonary regurgitation. And the same principle occur, can occur in diastole also, okay, mid-diastolic flow murmur. When there is a gross big MR, okay, severe MR is there, what happens? The blood from the left ventricle will enter into the left atrium okay, during the ventricular contraction. And during the next diastole, this large amount of blood from the left atrium will go into the left ventricle. So that can produce a mid-diastolic murmur. Okay. So these are called functional murmurs. Then coming to a uh, little bit high fi area, but just to know, you should understand what is the mechanism or uh, what are the components which we will do in this. This is dynamic auscultation. Dynamic auscultation is we are employing certain maneuvers to increase and appreciate increasingly increase the murmur intensity or you can appreciate with precision. Okay, so the diagnosis is probably this only. You can make sure with these maneuvers. Okay, so respiratory variation. I told already right side murmurs will increase with inspiration. The mnemonic is R-A-G-H-T. R for right side, I for inspiration. All the right side events will increase with inspiration except the pulmonary ejection click pulmonary ejection sound or pulmonary ejection click which increases with expiration and left side mammoths all will be increasing during the expiration okay left is mnemonic l for left and e for expiration okay then valsalva maneuver valsalva maneuver is basically straining okay so most mammoths decrease in length and intensity except for these two one is a hocm another is mvp hocm is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and mvp is mitral valve prolapse so these two murmurs will increase in intensity during your valsalva maneuver, all other murmurs. Because in strain phase of valsalva, the blood flow through the heart will decrease. Okay, so that is the reason why you get a decrease in intensity of all other murmurs and heart sounds. Okay. Then positional changes. With standing, what happens is most murmurs will diminish. Okay, the two exceptions are HOCM and mitral valve prolapse syndrome. Okay, what happens during standing? The venous return will decrease. Okay, the blood flow through the heart will decrease. So almost all the murmurs will decrease in intensity. Whereas these two will behave oppositely, the HOCM and mitral valve prolapse. Okay, with squatting what happens, blood flow will increase, the blood flow to the heart will increase, blood flow through the heart will increase. So all the murmurs will become louder except for these two, the HOCM and mitral valve prolapse where the murmur will decrease. Okay, so hope you got an idea about the heart sound murmurs. So next to your pulse, BP and JVP, these heart sounds and murmurs are very, very, very important. You should know the quality of the murmur, you, are, you should know the grading, you should know how to differentiate between the two murmurs. Okay, so all these are very important and your examiner love to hear about these murmurs. Okay, so please be thorough with all these murmurs. Here we have come to the end of this uh, module and thank you everyone. And in case of doubts, you can contact me, okay, via mail, okay, so painsraja at gmail.com okay or you can contact me in whatsapp also triple nine four one two seven three five nine okay so you can contact me and uh, see you in the next module okay thank you